Hello, my name is Nick Salmond and welcome to the Guide London website. I'm a Blue Badge Guide for London, one of 600 members of the Association of Professional Tourist Guides here in the city. That's the organisation behind the Guide London website. Now, usually at this time of year, we'd be out and about showing our visitors to London how wonderful the city looks in the spring. We can't do that this year, though, because of the lockdown here in the city. So what we're trying to do is bring you some of our guides through the medium of social media, through these live broadcasts on our Facebook, our YouTube and our Twitter channels. If you were watching last week on Monday, you would have seen an interesting talk about film locations in London and also of movie a uh, book locations featuring London. Um, that was on Monday. And then on Wednesday, we had our history lesson. We looked at some periods in London's history which have been difficult for Londoners of the time, the Great Fire of London and the Blitz, the bombing of the city during the Second World War. We, we looked at how Londoners coped with those two incidents. And then on Friday, we had a quiz to round off the week. Uh, we'll be doing the same this week, broadcasting on a Monday, on Wednesday and on Friday and broadcasting about this time. So that's four in the afternoon if you're watching in the UK, which is 11 a.m. if you're watching on the East Coast of America. Now today we're going to talk about food. When people come to London they come here for various reasons, maybe the architecture, maybe the history or the royal family, but London is a top destination if you're a fan of food as well. There is many different cultures based in London, it's a very multicultural city, so we have people from all around the world living here and they have brought their food expertise with them and it's said that you can get almost any kind of food somewhere in London. So today we're joined by David Drury. David is a Blue Badge Guide. He's going to tell us all about food in London. Now we are broadcasting live, so if you've got any questions for David, then simply put it onto the video feed in the comments field just below the video feed where you're watching this video. And we'll try and answer some of those at the end of the programme. And please also share this video with your friends and your family. We want as many people as possible to see the videos and we want you to come and experience London for yourself once the lockdown is over. So for now, I'm going to hand over to David, who's going to tell us all about food in London. David. Thank you, Nick. Yes, my name is David Drury. I'm a London Blue Badge Guide. I have been a guide now for over 10 years. And for anyone who's not visited London for a long time, you will get a heck of a surprise in that our food is now regarded as some of the best in the world. 20 years ago, that was not the case. In fact, to give you an idea, it's not just opinion. We have over 70 Michelin star restaurants. Not only that, but we've got great food right across the board and some fantastic street food markets as well. So these are obviously very unusual times, but one thing we don't stop do is eating. Hopefully, you know, in a few months time, we can start planning our trips again. You can come to London, be it for the first time or the 10th time. And if you're going to be here two weeks, that could be over 40 meals. So it's a great idea to have some places up your sleeve. So I'm going to talk about some of London's most famous foods, England's most famous foods, and also recommend you some of my favourite restaurants and hopefully answer your questions if you've got any at the end. So when you think of London food and English food, you've got to talk about but just a little quote um, before we move on. So, yes, yeah, so ask not what you can do for your country, ask what's for lunch. And that was Orson Welles. And anyone who knows me, uh, when I go and I travel a lot, uh, the first thing I want to do is plan all my meals and go to see some of the best restaurants these different places have to offer. Because, of course, food is very much part of every destination's culture. So you think England, you think London, you think fish and chips. So you will see here another great quote. So not only was fish and chips not rationed in the war, Amy Winehouse ate them at a wedding and George Orwell believed they could avert revolution. That along with beer. Queen Victoria said you give your people good cheap beer and you will avoid revolution. So a little bit of history of fish and chips. We're not too sure when the first fish and chip shop was or who actually did it specifically, but we know that it was the Jewish people from Portugal and Spain living in the East End of London who had the idea of marrying fish with chips, fried fish with chips. And when we talk about chips, we're talking about other people's French fries. That gets contentious as well because the Belgians would argue they invented the fries. 
Um, but anyway, now it is an institution. And just to point out what's in the picture, you can see the fish and chips. But that green splodge, if you like, uh, a great culinary term there, is mushy peas. They may not be everyone's cup of tea, but you have to at least give them a try. In the middle, you've got some tartar sauce. You might want to dip your chips in there and possibly a little bit of lemon on the fish as well. I also personally like mine with bread and butter. So let's start off by giving you five fairly different options of places you can try fish and chips. So my personal favourite and what I feel is one of the most authentic in London, it's called Master's Superfish. It's close to one of our big train stations called Waterloo. And it's a place where you'll find black taxi drivers, a few lucky tourists who found it, and mostly locals who know it's going to be good. Not only do you get cod and haddock and the traditional fishes, but you also get seafood. They give you a free pot of shell on prawns, free bread and butter and pickles. So it's an absolute great all round experience. If you want, you can even have bubbles with your fish and chips. They do Prosecco as well. The next one, especially in a very popular part of town, is one that is very retro called Poppies. It actually has a few branches, but this is the original in Spitalfields, uh, started by a man called Pop Newland. It's kind of his nickname. Uh, and if you go there, you will see all the waitresses in their 1950s uniforms. You'll see an old fashioned jukebox. You'll see lots of pictures of the area in black and white. So there's a real experience there. They sell some really good traditional English puddings as well, like sticky toffee pudding. If you quite like, you know, if you, if you like things sort of nicer, but you still want to try fish and chips, maybe Mayfair is a good place to go. So the Mayfair Chippy, there's one also in the city of London. And uh, Mayfair is an area where you've got lots of embassies, lots of art galleries, lots of five-star hotels. So it's a good place to go for some fine dining, but you can also get fish and chips here as well. If you want to go to the original, then check out possibly my favourite named fish and chip place, which is Rock and Soul Place. So it sounds as if it should be a hard rock cafe, but in fact, rock, soul and place are three types of fish. If you happen to do another great thing that's very popular in London and generally pretty good value wise is shopping. So our famous long shopping street, about a mile and a half, two kilometers long, is called Oxford Street. And just off of Oxford Street is a really another fun area to explore called Soho. And this is where you'll find the Golden Chippy. So if you're doing a lot of shopping, you know, it's quite exhausting. You probably want to go and have a nice lunch somewhere. So I'm now going to talk about some other British foods you might want to try out while you're here as well. So pies. People have been eating pies for centuries, probably for millennia. The Romans ate pies. But it's a very traditional food here as well. People tend to eat them at football matches. When I'm talking about football, I mean the one where you actually use your foot, not the American one. So soccer. Some of you guys might know it as so traditionally, you would have things like steak and kidney or steak and ale. Or if you're vegetarian, you could go for a, a cheese and onion. If you don't eat red meat, go for a, a chicken and mushroom. So Pie Minister is a good pie chain. They actually supplied uh, pies for the Queen, I believe, to her garden parties for a while. Bangers and mash, this is sausages with mashed potato. So one place you can get this is Mother Mash again. Another very cool area, which is just off a place called Carnaby Street, which is very famous in the 60s for its fashion still a very popular cool destination today not necessarily always on a sunday but you might want to try a roast dinner be it beef chicken lamb or a nut roast and you have to get it with yorkshire pudding so if you can see that picture that big sort of fluffy thing that is a yorkshire pudding i'm originally from yorkshire yorkshire is a county of england it's made out of pancake mix in a very hot oven and they rise and they go fantastic with gravy and a whole bunch of vegetables as well. Eaton Mess is the other picture you can see, and it's named after a dessert created at one of our most famous private schools called Eaton. It's where Prince William and Prince Harry went, um, just across the river from, from the Queen and Windsor Castle. So Eaton Mess is meringue, it's cream, and it's summer fruit. And the reason for it being called Mess, this one is quite sort of Instagram friendly, but sometimes it can look a bit of a, a, bit of a mess. And then last but not least, a full English breakfast. So sausages, bacon, toast, maybe fried bread. We're not so big on hash browns here, but also baked beans, Heinz baked beans. And that's a great way to start off your day. Nice big meal in the morning. And you might want to get that in your hotel. Otherwise, lots of great cafes to try out uh, in London. But 
Another food that you may be a little bit surprised as to, well, how on earth is that British, is curry. So, of course, the English have had a big involvement in India for a long time, be it through trade, exploration, and then, of course, British rule in India. Uh, in Indian independence then came just after the Second World War. And so a lot of those people moved over to England. Uh, obviously, we'd lost that generation during the war. You'll notice it's called Five Great Places for Ruby. Ruby is Cockney rhyming slang for Ruby Murray Curry. And Cockney rhyming slang is a traditionally London way of talking for people who were working class, who wanted to hide what they were saying from the richer people. So the original, again, if you want to go to London's first, or it's still existing one from 1926, this is Vera Swami again in Mayfair. And if you see the picture in the left, you will get sort of fine dining Indian. And there's a lot of great fine dining Indians. Uh, fair few Michelin stars there in Mayfair as well. The first thing, uh, Indian restaurant in London was actually 1810. So you're talking over 200 years ago. If you want something a little bit less fancy, but still very cool, still very modern, you can try cricket that has three branches and Dishoom, which probably has six to eight. Uh, and Dishoom is based on the old Irani cafes in Bombay, where you would get everyone from the road sweeper to the businessman. So it was a great mixing pot, a bit like London is today. If you want a little bit of street food, but in a nice hotel environment, you can try Hankies at the Montcalm Hotel. Um, the top right picture is a hopper. And this is actually the name of a restaurant as well. This is a Sri Lankan delicacy. So a hopper is made from fermented uh, rice and coconut mixture. And quite often it'll be served with an egg, as you can see there. If you want to get out of the centre a little bit, you can go down to South London, easy to reach on the tube, the underground to an area called Tooting, and that's where you'll get a lot of South Indian fare. Uh, Dosas are another similar type pancake mix, almost like a crepe. Uh, quite, and again, these, these are gluten-free gluten, uh, gluten -free as well, generally, so great if you were for any celiacs. So let's move on now to our next slide. And here is one of my favourite pubs in London. It's part of the only surviving big brewery left in London, which is Fuller's. If you drive in from Heathrow Airport, you'll pass it. Uh, but this is the Churchill Arms, so it doesn't come any more British than that. But yet it is run by an Irish landlord and it's got a whole treasure trove of uh, wonderful items inside. And usually this doesn't actually sell traditional food like the pies, the sausage and mash. This sells Thai food and it was the first pub in London that sold Thai food. But it is wonderful for all the window boxes outside. And if you ever are lucky enough to see it at Christmas, it has several hundred trees and supposedly more lights than Harrods, the famous department store, which has 10,000 of them. So let's look at a few more pubs you might want to try. So just say a bit more about the Churchill Arms. It's close to Portobello Road Market, which is in the area of Notting Hill. Some people may know that from uh, the Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant film. It's also close to Kensington Palace, which has wonderful gardens and is where Prince William and Kate Middleton live in part of the complex. You can visit the main palace that's over 300 years old. The Grapes is on the other side of town on the river and it's owned by Sir Ian McKellen. And this is a great place to try pies. I think that the pies I had in there were probably some of the best I've tasted. And you get these wonderful views as well. And a lot of these pubs have a lot of history including the Blackfriar. The Blackfriar has beautiful Art Nouveau interior, uh, and it's named after a monastery that contained Blackfriars in the area before King Henry VIII came along, the one with the famous six wives, and uh, closed down all the monasteries when he moved to the Church of England. Very topical right now is the Mayflower. We are now, of course, in 2020. I know it's hard to uh, remember the date or the day with uh, being on lockdown at the minute, but it's 400 years since the Pilgrim Fathers left from near here. In fact, the captain of the ship is actually buried in a nearby church. Uh, so the Mayflower is just oozing history and it has a lovely little terrace overlooking the river on the south side this time. And another great, uh, you know, Thames is the, re the River Thames is the reason London is here. Uh, so I realise I've included three river pubs. You've got the gun. And if you can see in that picture, you might just be able to make out a sort of funny looking dome structure with 12 sort of antennae sticking out. Um, that is the O2 Arena, which was used in the Olympics and is, in fact, the biggest selling concert arena in the world. So any band you can think of, any big band at the minute that can sell out 15,000, 20,000 people, they'll play there. Anyway, let's get back to the food. 
And I'm now going to talk about afternoon tea. So afternoon tea, again, something that is based in uh, back in history, um, it came about essentially with a grumpy aristocrat. So one of the ladies of the bedchamber of Queen Victoria was getting a little bit hungry in the afternoon. So she'd get her servants to snug, smuggle in tea and sandwiches. And then that's kind of grown and grown. And now it's something that people will traditionally do as sort of bit of a special occasion. Because if you go to some of the five star hotels, you know, it's, you're looking at 50, 60, 70 pounds even. So if you do want to book one, which I would recommend, if you're especially if you're doing a famous hotel, the Ritz is probably... Uh, as I put there, the granddaddy, it's got its own tea sommelier. He goes around the world looking at all these, these great tea plantations. The Savoy is the picture in the bottom left. You've got the lovely conservatory there, lots of light, uh, believed to be where the dinner dance was invented. And also the Connaught and Claridge's, uh, another lovely couple of, of luxury hotels. Because, you, you know, if you're going to do it, you may as well do it properly. If you want a little bit of a royal touch, you might go to Fortnum and Mason. Fortnum and Mason is a store that was created by two former guards of Queen Anne 300 years ago. Uh, it's now called the Diamond Jubilee Salon because it was opened by the Queen. And in fact, this store has what's known as a royal warrant. So it supplies the Queen with groceries. So she renamed it the Diamond Jubilee Salon in 2012 when she visited with her grandson, Prince William, and his wife, Kate Middleton. The other picture you can see, that pink paradise of the design lovers or, you know, people who like the kitsch and the, the OTT. Uh, Sketch is a great option. They do a great kids afternoon tea, uh, but it also has three Michelin stars. So that's the ultimate accolade. London has, I think, either three or four of the three Michelin stars. Gordon Ramsay is another one. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. If you want to go a little bit further afield and take a boat trip down the river to the home of time, you might want to go to Greenwich. And this is a lovely little museum that has a lovely kind of conservatory looking out onto a Japanese garden. Um, and that's the Fan Museum in Greenwich. And that's very, very cheap as well. So a bit bit smaller because if you are going to do afternoon tea and you're going to do it on a, on a big scale and, and have lunch and dinner, you need to have a big appetite. So, you know, think about that because those cakes and sandwiches will keep coming. And let's go to the next slide. And as they said in Monty Python, and now for something completely different. So I've picked a range of different dining opportunities, all available here in London. So the Escoffier Room is one of my favourites because it's a cuisine college, a culinary college. But it offers fine dining, so all these people training to be waiting staff and, you know, maybe the next Gordon Ramsay of the future. So at lunchtime, you can get seven courses for £30, which is incredible value. They, they do five, it's either five or six courses on Wednesday and Thursday evenings as well, but it's just quite early because it, it is a college at the end of the day. And they have different themes every week. Brasserie Zidel is a lovely little bit of France in London, and it's very much in the theatre district, just off of Piccadilly Circus, a bit like Times Square in New York. And it just has these splendid interiors and very reasonable prices for what is quite a luxurious experience. The bottom right picture you can see is the Middle Temple Hall. This is a hall where William Shakespeare performed to Queen Elizabeth I. You know, if these walls could talk, the stories they would be able to tell you. It's part of the legal quarter of London. So all the barristers and the lawyers will come here for their lunch and you can join them. Again, it's one you need to book, but it's just £25. The food quality is fantastic and you can pretty much eat as much as you want. So you could probably quite easily, it's technically three courses, but if you have soup, the various other starters, it can quite easily be seven. They've got a great cheese and biscuits range, lovely desserts. So yeah, that is a, that is a real bargain in, in these incredible surroundings. The picture on the left is a lovely view of the Thames from the building that is known as the Shard, the tallest in Europe, it's over a thousand feet. But don't go to the top and pay the $50 or whatever it is to go at the top. Just go halfway and have a meal or a cocktail. And there's a selection of restaurants there. I've been to the Chinese one called Hutong, so I can highly recommend that. And then last but not least, and arguably the most unusual dining experience, is to eat inside a prison. And again, this is just down the road from where I live. And it's a, a scheme that's taken off across the country and it's all been very well received. They get great reviews on TripAdvisor. Um, so you have to kind of submit a form because obviously there's a little bit of extra security, but they're all low level offenders 
and you know they're looking to retrain them and then hopefully uh, they're not you know they'll reduce their likelihood of reoffending and they can take their new skills into the workplace okay let's deal with the meat and the veggies now so just a few recommendations i'm not going to say too much my personal favorite um steak place is Hawksmoor, named after a very famous london architect if you've ever seen the front of westminster abbey he designed those towers the picture you can actually see is um from flat iron and this is a particular cut of beef which is very actually very cheap but very tasty and just for 10 pounds you can get this wonderful steak and even better they give you free ice cream another good place if you fancy a flutter on the on the cards or the roulette wheel uh, is heliot steakhouse in the uh, beautiful hippodrome casino just listed a whole bunch of uh, vegetarian restaurants here just noticed i've lost my picture there but it just showed some lovely lovely instagrammable vegetarian food mildred's is a bit of a soho vegetarian institution and uh, the malibu kitchen is very kind of californian based food in a beautiful building called the ned and palm vaults is overrun with beautiful plants in an area very much known for its kind of hipsters that's an area called hackney and now we'll deal with a sort of best of the rest because otherwise we'll be here all day so a few years ago, one of the sort of food trends was Peruvian food. And if you like sashimi, so the Japanese raw fish, then I would advise trying ceviche because it's just the same thing. It's raw fish, but with all these wonderful citrus flavours. So very, very tasty. You will see a lot of burrito bars in London these days. But personally, my favourite Mexican is a place called DF Mexico. Uh, I don't know if it's Taco Tuesdays, Taco Tuesdays or Taco Mondays. Taco Tuesdays sounds better where everything, all the tacos are two for one. But the DF, in case you're wondering, stands for District Federal, which is what they call Mexico City. Kiln is a place if you want to try cutting edge Thai food. The guy who started it also started another excellent Thai restaurant called Smoking Goat. And you can see that was the number one restaurant in London in our listings magazine Time Out. That is a great place to start. The Time Out Top 100. You could almost take it as a challenge if you had several weeks here. Palomar, great bit of Middle Eastern food, again, in the theatre, shopping district, and nice and easy to access. If you want to come out a little bit more to the suburbs where people live, again, it's, it's not too far to get to. Uh, there's a great Ethiopian place. It's actually one of my local restaurants. And again, it's constantly been extremely high on TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor has 20,000 restaurants. To be getting inside the top 10 is obviously, obviously doing something right. And you'll see I've listed another uh, variety of different nationalities and cuisines. London has over 200 nationalities. And another great article in Time Out is Around the World in 80 Plates. You really can eat your way around the world in London. Now we're going to move on to street food. I'm sure back home you've got street food markets galore. But I took some people around recently on a food tour and they said that London put New York's to shame so we're, we're pretty proud of our street markets and we just seem to be getting more and more borough market is probably the most famous i haven't put it on there you've probably heard about it they've had a market for over a thousand years but with this kind of food revolution uh, one of the big kind of food revolutions we had in terms of street food was a couple of guys who sold out in fact in the area i live in and um, they sold burgers out of a van in a car park and now luxury burgers are all the rage but going back to Borough Market, just around the corner in the railway arches, which are becoming increasingly disused and sort of reinvented, you've got Maltby Street Market. So that's a great place. Real range of stalls, over 30 in total. Pop Brixton, not too far from the Brixton Prison. So you could do two great food places in one. They have a lot of sort of music and uh, entertainment as well as they have a stage. Diner Armour is the one you can see in the right corner. That's in an area called Shoreditch. So for anyone who wants to kind of happen, uh, hang out with the cool kids, that's where that tends to happen in Shoreditch. So that's more of a night destination. Mercato Metropolitano, that's quite tricky to say. That's the other picture you can see. It started out in another area just on the outskirts of the centre called Elephant and Castle, great name. But it also now has one in Mayfair in an old church. And then Spitalfields is an area I would recommend you visit any day of the week. Uh, they have great street food, but great independent stores as well. And a really, really interesting area an area very much associated with immigration and that's seven days a week at spitalfield okay almost time to wrap this up and you can't you know in my opinion even if it's just a little taster you need to have something sweet at the end of the meal and if you're on vacation you know you need to treat yourself the bottom picture they are cronuts invented in new york by a man called dominic ansel but fortunately now for us he 
he's got a branch here at Victoria. And as you can see, it's basically a donut and a croissant come together. If you do go to Borough Market, you might come across, in fact, it's across from another very good fish and chip shop. Uh, and this is bread ahead donuts, big, big donuts. Uh, and they're actually baked. You can actually see and smell the bakery right behind where they sell them. If you want pancakes, another great food market, also just around the corner from Borough Market, is where the pancakes are. So whatever you're topping, be it from lemon and sugar to Nutella and banana, you can find that there. If you're an ice cream fan, again, in Soho, so very central, you've got Jalupo, uh, which sells gelato, so Italian ice cream. And just across the road, I believe they own it as well, is a great Italian restaurant called Bocca di Lupo. We haven't had time to touch upon the great Italian, Greek, Turkish, Chinese food. Just so many. Um, but last but not least here, we've got Dark Sugars. And that picture is actually one of their fantastic um, hot chocolates, which is probably one of the most photographed uh, items in London, I would imagine. If you see those three blocks, that is milk, dark and white chocolate. They do the shavings and they put it on the top of your drink. You might want to share. They're pretty calorific. OK, so that almost takes us to the end. So I'm just going to wrap up here. So just as a reminder, I quite like this quote. So, you know, hopefully now it's either time for dinner or time for lunch, wherever you are. I hope that's whetted your appetite. But I thought I quite like this quote. I don't know who it's attributed to. I want to be like a caterpillar. Eat a lot, sleep for a while, wake up beautiful. So my name's David Drury. As I say, I'm one of over 600 London Blue Badge guides. If you want to email me any questions, if you read this later on, there's my email, holdave at hotmail.com. And you can also find a series of very short videos. Some of you may not have had the concentration to, you know, to listen to me for 20 minutes. So I've called it Lung Done in 60 Seconds, and that's on YouTube. So lots of those big sites like Buckingham Palace, Westminster Abbey, uh, the Tower of London. I also do things like street art, movie tours. London has so much to see. Come and visit us as soon as this lockdown is over. I'll now hand you back to Nick and see if we've got any questions. David, thank you. thank you so much. I think you've made everyone very, very hungry indeed. There is a big argument going on on the Facebook page over whether you should have mushy peas with your fish and chips. <laughs> uh, Vicky Bailey says, yuck, mushy peas, yuck. But Sarah Reynolds says mushy peas are the best fit. So, <laughs> yeah, they're a bit like Marmite, which is another food that very much splits opinion. Yeah, indeed. So what about if you're from north of the border? What about if you're Scottish? Is there many places in London you can get Scottish food, say, haggis? Well, my best friend is actually Scottish, so uh, I always celebrate um, Burns Night, uh, which is in January, where you get your haggis. Uh, but if you want to have, find haggis throughout the year, you can maybe go to somewhere like Mac and Wild, or another great food market is down at one of the old docks. It's now been turned into a marina called St. Catherine's Dock, and they do a wonderful haggis toasted sandwich with cheese in there. So that's a real, uh, real guilty pleasure. I think we're all heading off um, for the supermarket now. Only infrequently. If you want to hear or find out more about David, then the best place to go is the Guide London website. There you can do a search for all our guides. You just go to Blue Badge Tourist Guides, find a guide, then you can type in the name of the guide that you would like, or you can just uh, scroll down and you can have, find details of all the 600 guides who are members of the Guide London site, or you can click on the tours. And the tours button will give you an idea of what some of the tours that our guides offer. And included in those tours, if I can find it, is this one here, the London Food Tour. So you can read more about London food there. And if you're interested in um, having a guide, you can message David or you can fill out our form at the bottom of the web page. Just say when you want to come to London, what's your name, give us your email, and some of our guides will get back to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. We'll be back on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Don't forget this recording will be on our Facebook and our YouTube channel. So if you missed a bit, you can go back and visit it then. Just search for Guide London and that will take you to our page. On Wednesday, we'll be delving back into history and we'll be looking at fashion in London. In particular, one very fashionable king, King George IV, and how he changed London's fashion. So join us 4 p.m. if you're in the UK, 11 a.m. if you're on the west the east coast of america so do join us for that but from david and from me for the moment goodbye